curious, I'm relatively new, about a year attending quick meeting. Um, it seems to me in my uh, observation that movements are most successful when they have really good leadership, when they're not, when they're very hierarchical and they have very good strategies at leadership level. Um, I'm happy to follow good leadership of a strategic leader, but Quakers are notoriously non-hierarchical. So could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, I, I hear you, you know, inciting us to really take action, to, you know, to get involved, to start organizing in some way. But um, in environmental movements that I've seen that have been effective, uh, there's been really brilliant people who have been doing some of the strategizing. So. Um. It can, I know, uh, herding cats comes to mind, the phrase. I know, I, I know what you mean about that being a weakness sometimes of Quakers, but I have some good news too, based on our experience with a Quaker Action Group in the 60s. Because when we were first taking medical aid, uh, trying to send medical aid to North Vietnam, people suffering in the war, the civilians, and it, it, it was creating great hues and cries among Quakers. And I remember a member of my own meeting when the proposal was made that my meeting send medical aid to North Vietnam. He got up and said, in meeting for business friends, we have to get our priorities straight. Now, what are our primary loyalties? Our first loyalty is to our country. Our second loyalty is to God. Our third loyalty is to God. We were having an amazing fights in uh, and, and, and it, it, it was a kind of cleansing experience. He, that friend did actually resign his membership after a while when he realized his priorities weren't quite the same as the rest of ours. But, but, there, it, but there was just, there was a lot, and, and, and as uh, our action in Quaker Action Group got more uh, oriented toward risk taking, and especially jumping on a boat and going out to the Seventh Fleet, um, there was like, whoa, wait a minute. And we, we were getting a lot of negative feedback from friends. However, the good news <coughs> is, once we got there and did that and got all that publicity and so on and came back and told our story, um, it was only a month later, I was down at Art Street Meeting House where there's a lot of tourists come and there are exhibits, Quakers, William Penn, and so on and so on. Uh, I went down there and suddenly found a big photograph of the Phoenix. And the tour guide was saying, and another thing that Quakers do, look, the Phoenix. <laughs> Whoa, that was quick. <laughs> so, uh, you know, character, re uh, what do you call that? Char uh, uh, character reform or something? <laughs> the, the changing of image happened really fast. And many, many, many more friends uh, came, uh, took a step in a, a more, in the direction of, of empowering themselves. So, uh, so I, I, I mean, if, if we had just waited until we got consensus, like there's that mistaken idea in my yearly meeting that you wait until Phil of your meeting all agrees on a particular action and then we take a step. Come on. It, but the other way of doing it, which is act, which actually works, is that those who are ready act. The others assess. Oh, oh, that makes sense. Hey, I'm going to get on that train. And so that I think is the way that leadership can work. That through demonstrated results. Does that make sense? Oh, in the back. Yes, yes, sir. I have two comments. One, it, it helps in me that you were complaining directly in the democracy. You know, when you were comparing us I, 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 
Yes, I get both of them. Well, I agree that the racism does play a big part in the politics here, and obviously constrain his behavior as well, right? For example, he, I'm sure he'd like to show his anger, but it's an obvious trap for him to step into being the angry black man. So there's the, the racial politics around Obama's leadership are very heavy because he knows better than most of us <laughs> what what snares exist with regard to racism. And and I appreciate that you're you're complicating the picture. And uh, in my comparisons with Sweden, in fact, in almost everything I say is really simpler than reality is. Uh, so I'm a great oversimplifier when I do these uh, do these talks. Uh, so what I'm hoping, though, is that they'll be provocative enough so that you'll take the next steps in complicating uh, the picture, because I think the bottom line still uh, still makes sense. Obviously, I'm not. I don't. I do believe in what I'm saying, but I think everything that I say, if I were saying it to the faculty of Swarthmore, I would say very much less, and I would put lots more footnotes and complications. In. <laughs> so thank you for complicating the picture about about what about about what's what. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the first question there was about the difference between Scandinavian democracies and American democracies and whether um, America is just too big for a participatory right. democracy and, and whether we, we're not doomed to some kind of representational democracy. Right. Well, but I don't think that that's oh. the distinction between what's going on in Scandinavia and what's going on in the United States. I think that probably where you and I agree is that the limitation on democracy is not the structure of, of representation, it's the fact that we have a capitalist system where power is controlled by people who own large organizations. And that's something that, by and large, Quakers just don't get, and I don't know why. So, you yes. answered his question. Yes. No, I, <laughs> address one. That's right, that's right, yeah. No, I, I agree. Because Sweden used to be as small, actually smaller than it is, and, so, and Norway as well. And they used to be just run by the rich. And huge poverty, like the major, majority of Norway was poor. poor. Poor farmers and poor workers and slums all over the place and all that kind of thing. And it would still be that way today if the rich were still running Norway. And the big difference was they, they made an assessment, what kind of leadership have you given us lately? Um, that, that assessment was especially poignant in the 30s, <laughs> of course, the Depression, right? And they said, you know what? We're firing you as the leadership group in this country. And that's what they did. So Sweden and Norway fired the rich as the leadership and instead put the Labor Party in charge. And that's what enabled them both to make the progress that they've made, including virtually getting rid of poverty. We, way richer than either of those countries, will always have enormous poverty. One fourth of Philadelphia is, is, is poor. We will always have enormous poverty, no matter how rich the United States we get, as long as the rich are running the country. Because every country where the rich run things has an enormous poverty problem. No country that's gotten rid of poverty has done that without getting rid of the leadership of the rich. That's simply empirically true. There's just no exceptions to that. The rich have never been able to deliver on, uh, on the poverty issue. They always have lots of poverty. And, and that's for good reason. I mean, from a, a kind of logical, uh, economic point of view. They can stay very rich if they keep a bunch of people poor. And the only con the countries with the track record are the countries that, that fired the rich as the leadership group in this country. We haven't done that yet in this country. Quakers haven't done that yet in this country. Many Quakers still believe that the rich are to be trusted to lead this country. Now, after two years ago, I don't know how that's possible. In the light of climate change concern, I don't know how that's possible, but there's still Quakers who believe, who trust the existing leadership class of the rich as being able to take care of us. And I just have that very strong disagreement. So I, I agree that that's the big difference, it seems to me. Because Sweden and Norway were in terrible shape 
when they were being led by the rich. Terrible shape. And they fired them. They just fired them. I mean, the rich were not happy to be fired, so they, you know, they did all this troops and killing people and stuff. But that's what that's what rich people will do to defend privilege all over the world. Yeah. I, I think you're missing a big piece of American culture in your analysis, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think Americans will ever. Uh, we think of improving the lives of the poor by making them richer. I mean, the whole goal is to become rich, and. I can't see the society functioning without that aspiration. Well, that is the aspiration of the rich, and they put and that culture the out. Rich, that be like us poor. and you will be happy. It's right? also the aspiration of the poor. To of live course. In a mansion. But it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, no, that's for sure. So the culture, the, the people who actually uh, have the biggest influence in creating the culture of a country are the rich. They're the ones who have, to have who, are not, who own the media, for example, these days, who own the mass media. So they can constantly put how to marry a millionaire, et cetera, et cetera, in front of people and say, we're the winners, you're the losers, we're the people who have the great life, you want to follow, you know, follow uh, the, the celebrity world and so on and so on. You are the people who we want to just watch television because we're the people who are fascinating and you're the people who are really boring and dumb and losers and all that stuff. And that, that garbage comes at us constantly. Yeah. But we're not paying for it. We're not even asking for it. As a working class boy, I never asked to be put down. I didn't invent this culture as a working class boy. I did not invent, nor did I ask for a culture that would invalidate me. But I was born into a culture that was busy invalidating me from before I was born, and a culture that was controlled and run by the rich for their own, for their own reasons. And, and it's not that the rich are alone in that. White people also developed a culture that put down black people. And so all the media were organized around that, the newspapers, the TV, you remember the old TV shows and so on? All those media, media of communication controlled by white people were busy putting down black people and saying, it's your fault, you're, you know, you're shiftless, you're lazy, you're this, you're that, you're full of all these stereotypes. And it only makes sense if you're gonna be privileged and in charge and want that to be stable, you need to convince the underclasses that they deserve to be where they are. It's only logical to organize things that way. It's oversimplified. Uh, yes, it I is. Mean, up, Oprah, late Oprah, for example, a wealthy woman, <laughs> you know, it, um, anyway. Right, and, and in her show, she's not full of disrespect, at least the ones that I've watched. She's not busy saying uh, poor people are losers, working class people should, uh, you know, should hide when they're serving us, uh, and so on and so on. She, she's not putting out those messages about black people and immigrants and so on and so on. So she, but she's a pretty lonely voice in the media world. So at least that's, that's, that's how I see it. I, to me, it's just so logical. I mean, if you were wanting to organize a system in which you get to have it your way, then you want to organize the images that support your continued rule. You wouldn't want to undermine yourself by putting out a lot of respect toward those who are the lesser beings. But the trouble with being a lesser being, like I was brought up working class, <laughs> the trouble with that is that then I internalize those messages. Yeah. So I, I was not, I didn't only like hear the messages from outside, George, you're working class, therefore you're stupid, and say, oh well, I noticed there's propaganda going on there. No, little boy George internalized that yeah. and came to believe that, yes, I'm stupid. If I were bright, like that middle class kid that I like to hang out with, then I would get A's, but I'm not, I don't get A's. I'm not, you know, like that. So just as women have historically internalized sexism and black people have internalized racism, so also working class people internalize classism. And it's so sad and it's poignant and I, it's still alive within.